Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Adams, and this is another Plastic Surgery Roundtable by the PlasticSurgeryChannel.com. Plastic surgery patients are concerned about scars. Some even decide not to have surgery because of potential scars. Luckily, we have good options to minimize scars, and that's what we'll be talking about today. With me are three very distinguished plastic surgeons from the Plastic Surgery Channel. Bob, are patients really concerned about scars? Absolutely, Bill. And I think one of the things that we have as plastic surgeons is the ability to really help patients get the best scar outcome they have from our operations. John, what are your thoughts? Oh, I totally agree. I think uh, plastic surgery, the opportunity to get the patient the best uh, appearance and outcome starts in the operating room and then we have lots of modalities and ways to help patients uh, in the healing period afterwards to get the best, very best result they can. So Lee, when you're talking to patients about scar therapy, what do you try to impress upon them? Well, you often get asked by the patient, will I have a scar? The first thing I try to do is educate the patient that every time we make an incision, there will be a scar, and it's our job to try to minimize that scar or minimize the appearance of that scar as much as possible. I think the important parts are there's a technical aspect to that in the operating room that all plastic surgeons should not leave the operating in room and are not going to leave the operating room until they're satisfied with the way they've technically closed the scar. And then, as John mentioned, after the operating room, there's many things that we can do to educate the patient, such as silicone gels, sheeting, other modalities to try to minimize that scar. So what about compliance? Do you guys find that uh is there differences in patient compliance and does that make a difference? Bob, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, there's lots of different factors which come into play. Time of year, uh, location of the body, whether the patient's a child or an adult, whether it's something that's been done for a more reconstructive uh, purpose or for a cosmetic purpose. And as a result, like all of our care, we need to individualize it so that it fits the needs to get that patient's goals and objectives met. Yeah, John, what, what type of challenges do you see with compliance? Well, I think it starts with the educational process. You've got to get to know the patient, and since we do have options, discussing with the patient what the options are and figuring out what they'll use and follow up with is important. Depends on what season uh, you operate on the patient. If it's summer and it's hot, then uh, some of the options that, that uh, require occlusion, patients can get sweaty and irritated and they may not want to use them. So the fact that we have options uh, and choices for patients, it helps improve our compliance, which in the long run is going to help improve their scar. Okay, well that's great. So I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk to you about your practices and what you guys are doing for scar therapy. So Lee, are there any proven algorithms for scar therapy and, and what are you doing in your practice? Well, there are some proven algorithms. We do know that silicone sheeting helps. We do know that compression in scars helps. You know, I think the real difference comes when you have someone who's a known poor scar former. In those patients, we have very specific algorithms that may involve, in more extreme cases, steroid injections at the time or after surgery. Um, all of them will get silicone compression or silicone gel. In patients who really have a good history of scar healing, you have previous scars to look at, we may not do much to those scars. But again, as Bob said, you really have to individualize to the patient. Uh, so Bob, how about your garden variety plastic surgery patient? What are you going to do for their scar therapy? Well, typically most incisions are a little bit too tender initially after the operation to be manipulated to the point where I'm going to have them massage the scar or apply something topically. So most of my patients go for the first few days to a week without much of anything. I'll put either a uh, steri strip on it that has a little bit of silicone backing uh, in the, either in the operating room or in the emergency department. At that point, it really depends upon the anatomic area. Um, if it's on the breast, uh, an area that's mobile, that's an area where I like to use a more occlusive uh, bandage that has some adhesive to it, uh, particularly if it's a longer or larger incision where applying the gel is either going to be too timely or, or uh, too cost prohibitive in many circumstances. Um, and I usually continue that for a good, you know, four to six weeks afterwards. Usually I'm going to see the patient back in that time span. After a month or so, I'll have an idea as to exactly how the scar is progressing. And if I'm uh, concerned or the patient's concerned with thickness, redness, itching, then we can get into some of the more advanced scar treatment protocols that Lee has discussed. Yeah, John, uh, timing of scar therapy is something that people talk about. What, what are your thoughts about when you like to implement your scar therapy? 
I think once the patient's through that initial healing period, uh, depending again on the surgery and the body location, typically at a week or two, uh, a topical silicone preparation I think is helpful and important. I think there's data to suggest obviously that silicone works. Uh, a moist uh, environment probably uh, helps scars uh, end up better, occlusion. Um, and then again, that discussion that you have with the patient preoperatively figures out how compliant they're going to be. Usually a gel I like better than strips. The other thing I think we uh, always got to mention, and it, again, it has to do with surgical scars or I think the fun about plastic surgery is just educating them. Anytime they get a wound, they got to be careful of the sun. So whether it's something we created as a surgeon or it's a scratch or a bug bite, if it's in a sun exposed area, you know, that educational process about sun avoidance uh, or the use of a sunscreen or in an appropriate area, a topical preparation uh, of silicone with a sunscreen can help. So Lee, two quick questions. One, uh, I think all of you have mentioned silicone, silicone-based products, whether they're strips or gels, have some science behind them. What is that science really about hydration of the epithelium? Is that the mechanism for how they work? Without question, we feel that that has a big part of it. The truth is we don't know the exact mechanism with silicone, but certainly keeping the wound moist, as John mentioned, hydrating the epithelium helps with the scar formation and keeps the scar from getting thicker. Um, beyond that, there's a little bit of guesswork, but we also know that UV light is certainly poor for scar healing, and that's where the, the sunscreens come in and are important to add, particularly in areas that are exposed to the sun, facial scars, other body scars that might be exposed during summer months. So uh, that's a good segue into products that are available now that have additives such as sunscreen, topical sil silicones with sunscreen. Bob, is that something that you feel like is a, a good addition to your armamentarium? Um, I'm more of a process person than I am a product person. Um, I believe the attention that I and the patient puts to the scar is more important than the exact material that they're using. There are an, enough generic products out there, some that have science, some that have uh, homeopathy behind them which uh, some patients will swear to and others won't. I like to have a certain spectrum of products I'm familiar with because then I'm familiar with them and I can speak to their use and, and the kind of results I've seen before. But patients, every, we all vary. There's lots of different ingredients in all the different products. We all know their sensitivities to the different products and sometimes it can be quite challenging to figure out if the person's having a contact dermatitis to one of the products or to the occlusive gel as opposed to actually an abnormal scar response. So uh, I'm all for scar products. I have my um, ability to recommend a few choice ones that um, I think work. Um, they may or may not add uh, sunblock or even some steroid material to them, um, but they're out there and, and again, like the practice of plastic surgery, as you get more experience with the products, you'll get more comfortable with them and be able to recommend them to your patients for their use. And that's great, great information. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is, is there's a new product, a topical silicone that has steroid in it. John, where, where do you see that fitting in to the scar therapy regimen and how would you recommend using that? Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, to answer the question, it starts with the conversation you have with a patient and getting their history. If you know that they have a prior history of poor wound healing or they've had prior surgeries and had bad outcomes or poor scars, then you might be more aggressive in initiating it earlier after surgery. If it's a patient that um, has a very favorable skin type and no prior poor history, then you might observe them and wait. And if they have a normal healing response, then maybe just stick with the plain silicone preparation. Um, so the typical thing is if the patient has no history, uh, say a breast augmentation, I'll use topical silicone alone. If, they, if I uh, notice in their early postoperative period some problems, I'll add a silicone preparation uh, with a steroid in a couple of weeks. So Lee, typically a topical silicone with a steroid you wouldn't start as your very first line of therapy. Is that, do you agree with that? I agree. You know, really, as John alluded to, um, genetics is what we're talking about with some of the scars. Some people are just going to form, form a good scar. Some people are not. We do know that silicone works. We do know that sun is bad for scars. And for years, in problem scars, we've been using silicone-based products and then telling the patient to add a sunscreen. The problem, I think, that we all probably have with scars and patients dealing with scars is compliance. And it's just like anything that you do. If they have to apply two or three different products, that's hard for anyone. 
So I think what we're seeing now are things that may increase and help with patient compliance. For instance, silicone gel with sunscreen is something that would be wonderful based on the science that we have in scars that are not problems. If you do have a scar that's beginning to show symptoms, itching, redness, raising, thickening, then certainly adding a steroid I think is something that most surgeons would, would do at that point. And then how long would you institute that steroid containing therapy? Well, you know, steroids, I always tell patients, are not always controllable like dialing up the volume, that it's more like turning on a light. So I institute it for short periods of time, usually a week at most, and then reassess because steroids really do cut down on inflammation, which is what is excessive in these poorly healing scars many times. But if you go too far, then you're going to get a scar that's weakened, thin, widened, and you're taking the patient to another type of poor scar, poor healing. And then Bob, just to, to follow up on that, at some point, if you've done all of this and you still think there's a problem, would you then think about injecting a steroid? Is that the progression that you go through? For a scar that's raised or thickened that has the kind of symptoms that uh, Lee describes, absolutely. Um, there are other modalities, uh, increased pigment in the scar for which um, some of my dermatologic colleagues have good success using some of uh, their light-based treatments. So um, like with all difficult situations, I'm not uh, at all against getting a consultation from someone else who may have a tool that I don't have necessarily at my disposal to get the best outcome. Well, that's been great. I really appreciate you guys being here. I've learned a lot and I think our viewers have too. Scars are the number one concern of surgical patients. And what our experts have told us today is that many of the patient concerns can be addressed with a well-defined scar therapy regimen that starts immediately after the procedure. We hope you enjoy this roundtable and we'll see you next time on the PlasticSurgeryChannel.com.